Sunday, May 21st, 2023, Youth and Young Adult Day theme is New Beginnings. The scripture will be coming from Isaiah 43, verse 18 through 19. And the colors are anything pastel. This is where we are. short and brief. For all visitors, all members, and all the people on Facebook, if you need a ride to church, please, please, please don't wait till Saturday night to call the church and say you need a ride. Please contact the church Monday or Tuesday. Tuesday is the latest so we can make arrangements to come and pick you up. You can also, my number is on the bulletin my number is 859-317-1466. Text me. Don't call me. Text me because I have a lot of things going on. So I'll read my text and I will get back with you. God bless you. Good morning, Great Living. Good morning. On behalf of my pastor, Elder, well, uh, Elder Mark Underwood, and the pulpit, the deacons, first lady, we want to welcome you. You want to once, twice, and a third time. Please come back to this with any time. We'll have a good worship here. Uh, we have a good anointed pastor. So please enjoy it. Enjoy the Lord. Enjoy it up. Have a great day and a blessed day. Amen. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Is anybody coming here today to praise the Lord?
Good morning, church. It's now time for our offer. The box that the Father left me in the entire box. The box in front of the missionary offering. Brother Manny is standing in front of pastors at a worship. Then he goes to the deacon coming to the town.
like the ones that have been having like the ones that have been. That had a father God. We don't know. Amen. 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 Amen.
say amen. amen. How many of you all expect a miracle? chapter 4 and verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time 
of me. Beloved, this is my desire, much like the Apostle Paul, for believers to realize the blessed privilege you now have being made a new creature in Christ Jesus. I think we forget that sometimes. Sometimes I think because of circumstances and because of the impact of the circumstances, the effects of them, we forget who we are in Christ Jesus. We forget the access to his power, that he is the supreme being, the supreme ruler and authority over everything. Because we're too busy focused on how our circumstances are affecting us. Amen. Amen. Child of God, it, it, I need you to know today that prayer is essential. Amen. Prayer is essential. And yes, even myself, my prayer like to be better. Amen. I always feel like I can do more. Yeah. I can be more consistent or more fervent in my prayer life. You know, the moment you think you've arrived, you're in trouble. But it's essential for the life and welfare of the believer. Somebody may ask, well, Pastor, why is that? And the reason is, is because we still reside in the place of testing and trial. Amen. Somebody just got fit, just came out of a struggle in a trial. Amen. Somebody's in the middle of one right now. Amen. And don't worry, if you just got out or you're in the middle of one, or say you're in Going through that right now, don't worry, the one's on his way. One is on his way. You do know that this journey is not an easy road. And between every mountain experience is a valley. Prayer is essential. It's essential. It is so much more than just mere utterance of words and phrases put together. It's so much more than just feelings or desires and needs. It's, it's a spiritual thing. Beloved, God ain't nothing to play with. He's not your four-leaf clover. He's not your genie in a bottle. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual communication. It's a spiritual commerce between God and his beloved. It's so much more than what we think it is. Spiritual commerce with Jehovah himself. The advancement, it's the advancement of our desires and our needs to him. And an intercourse of exchange of favor, protection, provision, and blessing. Because of that spiritual commerce, you can go to God. You ain't got to go to the preacher, the pope. You, ain't, you can go straight to God. 
and you can go to him. And in that spiritual commerce, you can pour your heart out. And because you have that communion with this God, he in turn gives you favor, protection, provision, and blessing. It's spiritual business, y'all. Prayer is spiritual business. The work of the Holy Spirit is essential in this practice. For anyone who tries to pray and petition God without the Holy Spirit, it's simply utterance from their lips, desires of their flesh that reach no further than man. Those who pray without the Holy Spirit, because you do know I our petitions must be in the main, made in the will of God. Yeah. You must ask and pray in the will of God. The Holy Spirit gives us that. The fellowship of our spirit with his great spirit, it helps our infirmities. It helps our weaknesses. It, it gives life and it gives power. For alone, we know not what to pray. Ain't that something? It's crazy that, you know, we know what we want. We know what our desires are. But we don't always know what we need. We don't always know what we need. I, argue that we do know some of the things that we need though. But we don't always know. And then for that which we do know, we don't even know how to ask for. Right. 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 But thank God that the Spirit of God intercedes on our behalf. Hallelujah. We're speaking to God's people, y'all. Because if you have the embodiment of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will intercede with your spirit, giving utterances and groans and moans that which you don't even understand. Child of God, the text before us, it presents a, a connection with the position of Christ in his intercessory position. But we do know he is interceding on our behalf. And the thing is, is Christ's position intercessorily is essential to our prayers, not only being heard, but also accepted. For yes, true prayer, true prayer can't be true prayer without the Holy Spirit, but it can't be a prayer that prevails without Christ. I need you to hear me. In other words, we can pray in the Spirit, but if Christ isn't in his position, interceding with blood on our behalf, our prayers can be accepted. Child of God, to the one who prays without a Savior, it's a direct insult to deity. Who do you think you are? <laughs> Any man who believes he can approach God and God hears him and he doesn't come with a mediator or a savior or go-between is arrogant and therefore puts himself on the same level as God. God is not obligated to hear yeah. your requests. Yeah. He's not obligated to hear your requests. You going to pray and don't even want to call on the name of Jesus? Sure. You just as foolish 
as the next man. Those who come and they pray without blood, they don't have an acceptable offer. We are filthy rags. We are filthy rags. Don't you remember? God put up a wall of partition because of the offense of man. When God kicked Adam out of the garden, he put the flaming sword at the entrance. Cherubims at the entrance. There was no access back in here. You forfeited your position. If God left every one of us to ourselves in our reprobate state of mind, he would be justified. That's the truth of the matter. God is not obligated to hear our pains cry. But child of God is good news in that though. It's good news for us in the text. Because those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, we got access. We have some access that others don't have. He tells us in the text, he says, let us therefore Come boldly. Yeah. Let us therefore approach the throne boldly with confidence, honesty, frankness. That's what he's telling us. He's saying that we can come to God like that now. We can come to him and pour your heart out before the Lord. And we can come just like we are. Say what you feel. Ask what you need. I don't know about y'all, but when I talk to the Lord, I ain't concerned with being all deep and wonderful. And all philosophical. I come to him the way I'm going to come to him. Like someone whose heart is hurting. Lord, I need you to get me out of this business. So worried about praying the right way. And not even and when the only thing we should be worried about is just praying in the right spirit. You worried about who hears you and what man you got to say. Ain't that something? Some of the loudest folk who do mouths never shut. For some reason, can't speak to God. That's something, Because you're worried about how you're going to sound in front of other people. If you're going to say it the right way, if you're going to start it the right way, ask in the right way, finish and close it in the right way, just talk to the Lord. It ain't that hard. We hear you talking all the time. We can't get you to shut up. This talk to God. All right. The problem is that some of us ain't willing to be vulnerable. We ain't willing to be exposed. We're not willing to become naked before God. To worry about other people's opinions. Oh, yeah. Child of God, I'm so glad today that things are different now under the new economy of grace. Now that we're no longer under the economy of the law. And see, the writer of Hebrews here was writing to Hebrew Christian converts who he was writing to. So he had to teach in a way that they could understand, so they could reconcile what they know and understand about the teachings of the Torah, the teachings of the law, and the old covenant church, and reconcile that with the teachings of Christ and the gospel of grace. 
because every day they knew was ritual and ceremony. Anything under the law. And Christ came teaching that all were under grace. Christ came teaching, if you just believe in me, for if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, thou shalt be saved. So he tells us, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. The throne, he had to bring this up. Because when you think about the throne, what it did for the Hebrews is it took their mind back to the temple. It took their mind back to the temple. We know how the temple was set up. You had the outer court, the inner court. You had the first, you had the first room behind the first veil, and then behind the second veil was the inner room, which was the holies of holies. There was two curtains. That second curtain, only the high priest could go behind that curtain. And he only went once a year. And before he could go in to give sacrifice for and a blood offering for the people's sin, he first had to give a blood offering for himself. Because he himself was dirty. He himself had sin stained on him. And therefore could not even enter into the room without blood. Child of God. Behind that second curtain in the room, in the inner room, in the holies of holy, there was an ark of the covenant. Yeah. Yeah. And we know that above that ark was the mercy seat that was overlaid with gold. That's where the high priest would sprinkle the blood from the offering. And then above the mercy seat, you had the wings of the cherubim. The Shekinah glory of God was in that place. It represented the very presence of Jehovah. And the thing is, it's just like, it's just like Moses and the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. Y'all remember? Moses was the only one allowed to go up the mountain. The people couldn't even touch the mountain. Moses would go up the mountain and he would get lost behind the clouds because it wasn't meant for the people to see what Moses was doing on their behalf with God. The same thing with the temple. The people could not go in that inner room. Even the priests who were subordinate to the high priest could not go behind the second veil. They could only go behind the first veil. Right. If anybody else went in that room, matter of fact, if it was, if they only went in there once a year, and it was so dangerous for them to go in there, is every time they went in, the folks, the people of Israel on the outer court, they would be out there just praying, Lord, please don't kill us. <laughs> Every time he went in there, they just hoped he came back out. Praying for God to accept the blood sacrifice. And give them one more year of forbearance. Hallelujah. That's the throne. In verse 14, the writer here tells us that he is our great high priest. And that he has passed into the heavens. So therefore hold fast to your profession. What he is telling us is that Christ as our great high priest. And I don't want to get too far into what him being the great, the greatness of his high priesthood, of his priesthood. But he, when he says great, he's just saying that not after any other order. Not after the ironical order or the Levitical order. And even above the order of Melchizedek. He said it was not of any other order. And he supersedes. Transcends beyond any other order. And not only was he our high priest who went behind the veil. Or went behind or through the first heaven. Which is what we call space. Outer space. And made it to the third heaven. 
Because, you know, we can't see beyond that first heaven. We, we, I, we can't see beyond that the darkness, the blackness of our space acts as a veil between us and God. And it's telling us and letting us know how Christ has gone beyond that. And he is sitting there now, and not in the not, not in the metaphor or a presence of God, but in the literal yes. presence of our holy God. Yes. And he is not only there, he, he, he's there now, but he was also there at Calvary. Yes. He was also there at Calvary. And in that time, because he's at this throne. Where you and I can't access. He's at this place where you and I don't have any reason, any God doesn't have any reason to give us access. But yet our high priest who was without sin yeah. entered behind that curtain once and for all. Ain't that something? My God didn't have to go in year after year. Our high priest went in one good time. And it fully satisfied and quenched the wrath of God on his people. He gave us, therefore, access. How, how do we know this? Well, we know that Matthew tells us that at the time that Christ gave up the ghost, the Bible said that the earth began to quake. The mountains began to reel and rock. That the graves busted open. And it also tells us that the veil was torn from top to bottom. See, at first one, when I first thought, well, if the curtain is as, as dense as it was, and how heavy as it was, surely, it, okay, if the earth was real and rocking like it did, then yeah, that, that tremble could cause it to to tear or mm -hmm. cause it to fall down or cause it to shred somehow. Mm -hmm. But the scripture said that it tore from the top yeah. to the bottom. Yeah. Last I checked, the earth was under my feet. Yeah. So how did it tear from the top? Yeah. That means that God, the hand of God, yeah. ripped that veil yeah. in two. Yeah. Giving us now access yeah. directly to Him. Yeah. We no longer have to sit yeah. in the outer court. Yeah. We no longer have to sit at the base of the mountain. Yeah. But, child of God, we now can go yeah. to the mountain top. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. We now can go to God. Yeah. We can petition God on our behalf. In the name of Christ. Yes. Because what Christ has done. He tells us, beloved, when we look at this throne and we look at what Christ has done for us in Calvary, he tells us now come boldly to the throne of grace. The wall of partition has been torn down. We're no longer in the outer court. And Christ is right now in that holy place making intercession on our behalf. That's good news for us. Because the thing is, the writer thought it was important that in acknowledging Christ as our great high priest, he thought it was important to point out that we don't we don't serve a high priest who has not been touched with our infirmity. Yeah. What do you mean by that? He's saying that this Christ who is petitioning God on your behalf, he's not doing it because he pities you. He's doing it because he's felt what you felt. Yeah. He's gone through 
what you have gone through. For he counted it not robbery to be made in the likeness of sinful flesh. And the scripture was was careful to make sure that they said the likeness of flesh. Because we got to be clear is that even though Christ was was tempted, tested, just like we were, it wasn't exactly in the same nature. Because our nature is depraved. What does that mean? It means that the motive of the tempter came from an evil place. And that those who were the ones being tempted we give in due to our own sinful flesh. Yeah. But Christ being made in the likeness of flesh, in the likeness of man, knew no sin. So even though he saw how beautiful Mary Magdalene was, <laughs> he didn't move with his flesh. Even though he saw the hurt over everybody, when Lazarus died, he still didn't move with a carnal mind. When they came to arrest him, when they chased him out of Jerusalem, when they marginalized him, when his own people, his own friends, those who were part of his family, when they talked about him. Y'all don't hear me. But our God has dealt with Every hurt, yeah. every pain yeah. that we have felt in this life. Yeah. You felt the baby. My Christ has felt that. Yeah. You felt like folks slandered you, yeah. made fun of you. Yeah. My Christ has felt that. Yeah. You've been homeless. Yeah. My Jesus, you've been homeless. Somebody said, I've been bored all my life. Yeah. My Jesus has been bored. Yeah. Somebody said, I've been hungry. Yeah. My Jesus was hungry. Yeah. He was thirsty. Yeah. He was tired. Yeah. He was beat up. Yeah. He was beat down. Yeah. He was pushed down. Yeah. He was thrown in jail. Yeah. He was laughed at. Yeah. He was mocked. Yeah. He was hurt. Felt it all just like you feel. So we don't serve a God who is just pitying on us. But we serve a God who is petitioning on our behalf because he empathizes. He sympathizes as one who has been where you are. Ain't that some good news? Why do you think that God has spared you in your life? has taken you through danger, seen and unseen, has taken you through trials and tribulations and storms that you couldn't find your way out of, but God still brought you through, and you don't look like what you do to Why God, why do you think God did that to you? And so you could be a testimony for somebody else. So somebody can see your trouble and see your struggles and see your heartache and to see your story and look at themselves and say, God did it for them. And sure it is for me. If God fixed their situation, if God flipped their circumstances upside down, if God can still make a way out of no way for them. And even though they haven't been perfect, and even though they didn't do everything right, and for some reason this God still showed up, and for some reason this God still changed and made a way out of nowhere, and this God still picked me up and picked me up and turned me around and changed my mind and changed my walk and changed my talk, and no matter how messed up I was, and somebody. Faithful. And you know what? We need to be 
reminded of how faithful my God is. And the thing is, one, I can't get new revelations without some new trials. I got to go through some stuff that I ain't dealt with before so I can have a new soul in my heart to tell somebody what God did for me. He's not slack concerning his promises towards you and I. But God will fix it in due time. By and by, God will take care of it. God will make a way for it. God will show up right on time. And God will, when He shows up, he comes with proper aid. I know this because he said, he said, come to the throne boldly. So I'm coming just like I am. I, I, I've been saved, but I still got sinner problems. I've been saved, but I still got some problems. Trusting God with my whole heart. I've been saved, but I still got issues, not leading to my own understanding, but it says come just like y'all, and just bear it all before Jesus at the throne of grace, because I got some good news for you, if you can come to God and lay prostrate, put your face to the ground, and pour your heart out. To a holy God, then God will come to your rescue. And the Bible says that when He shows up, He's coming with two things. He's coming with some mercy, and He's coming with grace. Come on, all right. That God got some mercy for me. And the mercy in the text is in the passive sense. In other words, he's got mercy for my past failures. To behold his judgment and his wrath for where I keep getting it wrong. For where I keep messing it up. God says, I got enough mercy that will endure all generations. Thank the Lord, all right. And I like the grace gift because when he shows up with grace, it's an active grace. It's an active favor. And he tells me, not only am I going to dismiss and forgive you and withhold my price, but I got some favor in your life that no matter what you're dealing with,
what do you say? For God is faithful. He's faithful. And the real shout in them is that he's faithful to us in spite of us. We're such flawed, feeble, fickle creatures. But our God is constant. Upset because and, and his grace or his his character changes because of your disobedience, your unfaithfulness, because how much we fail to look like him, he remains constant. Some of us, you got to go through trial for one or two things when you belong to the Lord. One is to increase your faith. Because you got to increase your faith. You got to grow you up. And the other, and sometimes the Lord got to visit us. Because of the rod of correction. Does a rod to reorient you and put you on the path that you belong. God don't allow us to go through trouble for no other reason. And he does it because he loves you. Don't get that twisted. If he didn't love you, he'd leave you to yourself. Don't only keep me in hell keep me in the hormones. Keep being a liar, a thief. Don't keep doing it. And see, you think it's all good and you keep doing it because God ain't visiting you. Yeah. It could be, and he could be long suffering with you. Or he could just be leaving you to yourself. Because you're none of his. You think you belong to him because you go to church.
Let her God say, Amen. God bless you, God. And it's not to see this out of our Let the Lord be gracious unto you. Lord, Amen. Amen.